Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Church. Happy Sunday. Good to see everybody here. Thank you to everyone that's joining us online. Uh, we just want to invite you to stand up with us because we're going to praise God this morning. Good morning. You guys awake?
not fail me you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things desperate for you. We want to know you more and more and more and more. God, without you, we are nothing. And we know that no matter what it is that's going on in our lives, all we have to do is look to you, God. We are so thankful. God, we love you and we surrender to you today. you dream. 
is divided but God in you we have unity because you are above all things we want more of you God less of ourselves less of the world less of the politics less of the news we just need more of you speak to us now and draw us to you we love you, and we lift you up in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. We're so glad that you're here with us today, and whatever you're carrying around with you today, there's a lot of heavy stuff going on for a lot of people. And um, I just want to take a moment for us to pray. Uh, Kip's mom is uh, not doing well at all. And she's um, going to be going home to the Lord soon, uh, very soon. So uh, we want to lift her up in that family as well, okay? Father, we pray that you would be with Rosalind and with Kip and his whole family, that you would lavish them with your peace and with your comfort and your love, and that they would know your presence as you welcome her home. We thank you, God, for the many ways that you're going to show up and do the miraculous like you always do. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <sighs> Sorry, weepy. That happens to me. So we're glad you're here with us. If you're visiting, thank you so much for being here with us. We are honored that you chose to come and, and hang out with us this morning. Um, I'd love to invite you to get uh, plugged in with us. If you go to trygrace.com slash connect, you fill out our online connect card and let us know a little bit about yourself. We'll let you know a little bit more about us. Um, so I'm happy to uh, get you hooked up with some other ministries that are going on here, let you know what, all the things that we're doing here at church. Um, and so we'd love to have you be a part of that. If, they, if you've got things on your heart, you need someone to stand in prayer with you, then uh, reach out to us at prayer at trygrace.com. Shoot us an email and we'll be praying with you. All right, um, I am gonna go ahead and turn it on over to you now, Pastor Rob. All right. Thank you, no really, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny, it's, uh, it's even with limited seating, it's hard to get anybody to sit on the front rows. Have you ever noticed that? I'm just wondering if anybody noticed that. Preachers notice that. I don't, but anyway, good morning. Welcome to Grace. So glad that you are here today, whether you're here in person with us or you're joining us online. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, if you are new, we welcome you in Jesus' name. We're glad that you're here too. Well, it seems that the political cycle is nearly over. I'm going to miss all those flyers in the mail, aren't you? All being inundated with phone calls, and no matter where you go, seeing political or hearing political ads. I'm just going to completely miss those. Not. <clears throat> now, don't misunderstand. Uh, elections are vitally important in selecting people who are going to govern us, and so I don't want you to misunderstand. We have an important civic duty, a responsibility uh, to elect those people because the people that we elect who govern us operate from a philosophy or a worldview that will have an impact on our lives. So it is important, but I am not going to miss the political cycle. Uh, speaking to the reality of elections, Andy Stanley said something I want to share with you this morning. And he said this. It's kind of obvious right now, but hang on, there's more to it. He says, your candidate will win or lose based on how America votes on Tuesday. So your candidate either won or is in the L column, okay? It's, that's just the way it is with elections. And while we may be still waiting for a few of the races to be called, it's looking like we're going to have new leadership in, in uh, the presidency. And uh, you might be really happy about that, 
Uh, some of you may be really sad about that. It may be depressed. You may feel anxious or even cheated. I'm sure most all of us have felt some level of anxiety when it comes to this. But I want you to listen to the rest of the quote that Andy Stanley says. He says, your candidate will win or lose based on how America votes on Tuesday. But the church wins or loses based on how Christians respond in the days that follow. We've selected our leadership politically. How we choose to respond, whether it's the person you wanted to win or not, how we choose to respond as believers in Jesus, how we choose to respond as Christians, as followers of Christ, is going to say a lot to the people who are watching us. And it is important that we respond rightly. Now, there is a belief among people uh, when they elect a candidate that their preferred candidate is the one that is going to restore greatness to the land, to the presidency, to America. It's going to put it in the office. So what is, in thinking about restoring greatness, what is our best response to a nation that is divided, to a nation that is at opposite ends about what it views politically? I'm glad that Jesus didn't leave us empty-handed not knowing. He gives us a path, and He speaks to greatness, and it gives us our best response during this time. In Matthew chapter 20, if you want to turn there in your Bible, your Bible app, or it'll be up here on the screen for you. In Matthew chapter 20, there's a story that happens, and it says then, and the reason it says then is because we're going to come back to what was said just a few verses earlier in just a moment, but I need to start here. Then, after what happened, happened, then the mother of Zebedee's sons, Zebedee's sons were James and John, sons of thunder is what they're, not God of thunder, sons of thunder, okay? Uh, the sons of thunder, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. Don't you like it when people ask a favor of you without letting you know what that favor is? I, I, I you know, when people come up, hey, would you do me a favor? And I'm like, how do I answer that? Because I don't know what you're going to ask. I mean, seriously, I don't know what you're going to ask, and so I usually respond conditionally, well, it depends. What is it that you want? I mean, if, if it's something I can do and it's right to do, then I'll do what I can. And, and uh, the story uh, is recorded, this story is recorded in the other Gospels, and in fact, Mark tells us that it's actually, that it is actually, they came and asked and basically said to Jesus, we want a blank check. Lord, give us what we want. In other words, tell us that you'll give us what we want, and then we'll tell you what we want. Well, Jesus didn't fall for that. And he says, what is it you want, he asked. And the mother said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. This doesn't sound like much to us, but this is a big ask. This is a big favor. To be seated on the right and the left-hand side of Jesus when he entered into his kingdom was to be put in a position of power and greatness. And of course, one of the other things we find out in the other Gospels is this, that it is actually James and John who put their mom up to asking this question. Real men, these disciples. Mommy, mommy, could you uh, go ask Jesus if it's okay I mean, seriously, what is up with that? Thank God for mommies. We need our mommies. But man, you're a grown man. I mean, seriously? You had to have your mom do it? Anyway, here's the thing I want you to see here. The lust for power produces cheap loyalty. The lust for power produces cheap loyalty. In other words, there is no staying power in a follower who is just riding your coattails, wanting power and glory and greatness. Jesus was their path to greatness, and they were going to ride his coattails. Can I just tell you something important today? Jesus is not our path to greatness and power, at least not in earthly terms. And anyone who seeks to ride the coattails of Jesus to power and glory, to greatness, something's wrong. And it is unfortunate that Christians have often tried to merge the kingdom of God with the kingdom of men and to enforce that kingdom on everybody else. 
whether it's a political power, fiscal power, judicial, legislative power, can I just tell you something honestly today? This is so, so important. We will never make the kingdom of God a reality on earth through political power. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. You will never make the kingdom of God a reality on this earth through political power. The cheap loyalty was evident in the disciples when he was arrested because what did they do? (laughs) They scattered like cockroaches. They scattered like cockroaches. Even Peter declared, I'll die for you, Jesus, and denied him three times. While this lust for power and greatness produces a cheap loyalty, what Jesus longs for us is a love that produces lasting faithfulness. He wants us not with cheap loyalty, but lasting faith. Y'all are quiet this morning. Okay, I'm going to keep going on. Jesus said, remember they asked, can we sit on the right or the left? And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. You have no idea. You have no clue. And he asked them, can you drink the cup I am going to drink? And I mean, without hesitation, they said, oh yeah, we can. We can. Jesus is blunt here. You, you don't have a clue. You don't have an idea what you're asking of me. You don't, you don't understand. And, and so let's go back just before this big favor, before this big ask, Let's see what Jesus had just said to them. Now, as Jesus was going, this is verses 17 through 19, as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Now the good news is that on the third day he will be raised to life. And to describe this experience that he's about to have, he uses the idea of a cup. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Are you able to do that? And they're like, oh yeah, we can. Now we don't think a lot about cups, unless you want coffee, right? Everybody had their coffee fix this morning? Some of you still got the coffee in your hands. All right, that's all right. Nothing wrong with that. We don't think much about it. I mean, they're they're just kind of common everyday things. But once in a while, a cup can hold special significance. We raise our cups to toast the uh, the new couple that's getting married, right? We toast them. We may hold up a cup in remembrance of someone or something. It's, it's It's an important thing. Or we may raise a cup up in victory, in celebration, something that happened that we accomplished, that we, we overcame, and we raise a cup in celebration. You know what I think? I think the disciples are thinking cup in the sense of victory, celebration, power, glory. But cups in the Old Testament and here in this passage have a decidedly different picture. It isn't about toast blessings. It's not about victory or celebration. The cup that Jesus is talking about has a whole different significance. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night that he is going to be betrayed before he is crucified, Matthew tells us in verse 20, chapter 26, verse 39, going a little further. Now, you remember, this is gar- the garden before everything happens, everything that he's going to experience. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. Listen to the prayer. My father, if it is possible, may this cup. May this cup. (laughs) Jesus didn't want to drink this cup. And they're like, oh yeah, we'll do it. May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. James and John are envisioning a palace of influence, of glory, seats of prominence, seated on the right and left hand of Jesus. And when Jesus is talking about a cup, he is envisioning envisioning himself being crucified. And the only people on his right and left are people who are crucified along with him. And there on the cross, he drinks deep of this cup. He experiences the consequences of our sin. He experiences wrath, judgment, suffering, pain, and death. 
No wonder Jesus said to them, you haven't got a clue what you're agreeing to here. You have no idea. Jesus knew something that the disciples did not know. He said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. And, and they did. All of the disciples, according to church tradition, were martyred for their faith in Christ. You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. So that's the end of the conversation, right? Everything's good, everything's neat, tidy, wrapped up. Not, not at all, because you see, the other disciples heard about James and John sending their mommy to ask Jesus to let them seat at the right and left hand, and they're not happy about it. When the ten heard about this, verse 24, they were indignant with the two brothers. You think? You think maybe just a little bit? Inwardly, this is probably something all of them wanted for themselves. They were vying for themselves, but they didn't dare ask. Only James and John did, and then they sent their mommy to do it. And I, I can imagine that this argument broke out in this time. They, they're arguing. You think you're great? How, who do you think you are to ask that? I mean, I should be beside Jesus on his right hand or his left hand. I mean, I, I'm the one that's in this inner circle. They misunderstood what Jesus had said to them. They misunderstood power. They misunderstood greatness. They wanted, make no mistake, they wanted greatness. They wanted it. So a timeout was needed. You know how little kids get in a little, and you got to give them a timeout? So Jesus sent the disciples to a timeout. He called them together and said, you know, this is something that they knew, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Jesus reminds them, this is how the world, this is how your society, this is how your culture operates. This is how people apart from God operate. This is not how my people operate. These are how people apart from the kingdom of God operate. They rule over Gentiles, lording over them and exercising authority over them. See, they experienced this under the dominion of Rome. They were dominated by Rome. They lived under the authority of Herod, of Pilate and other governors. And the disciples, the disciples did not like being lorded over. They didn't like those who exercised authority over them. They didn't like it yet. Don't miss this. They couldn't wait to get in positions of power and of greatness, to have prestige so that they could then be the ones that exercise and rule and lord over. Can I tell you that power isn't the problem. A lot of times you'll hear people talking, what's the power? Power is the problem. Power is not the problem. It's how power is used. Power that is used wrongly, it corrupts, it destroys. It is a source of great injustice in our world. It makes life miserable for everyone except for the one whom the power favors. All too often, People in authority, in politics, in leadership, or other areas, use their power for personal gain, not for what is right and good. And we all suffer because of that. Power that is used rightly is a blessing, but power that is used wrongly is a curse. It's not about power being the problem, it's about how power is used. Because no one had more power than Jesus. No one has ever had more power than Jesus. He spoke and the storm calmed down. He spoke and a little girl came back to life. Lazarus came back to life. He offers simple little prayers and people are healed of their sicknesses, their diseases. They are delivered from the oppression that they are under. Jesus, you want to talk about power? Jesus had power. But the question is, what did he do with his power? After pointing out how people in society and culture, that is 
uh, different than the way God works, he, he tells the disciples this. He says, this is how they operate. But listen to what he says. Not so with you. This is how the world operates. This is how culture operates. This is how society operates. But if you're my follower, if you are a believer in me, if you are in the kingdom of God, not so with you. Don't you dare follow their lead. Not so with you, Jesus said. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Ooh. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Anybody? Sign up sheets. There's nothing wrong with wanting greatness. Listen to what Jesus said. Whoever wants to become great among you. There was nothing wrong with wanting greatness. It's just the way that you pursue to get it, the path that you are on to greatness. There's nothing wrong with greatness, but Jesus redirects it, and he spells out a different path to greatness. See, we often in our world, our society, our culture, think greatness comes by power. And Jesus says, no, greatness comes by serving. To become great, you have to be a servant. You have to be a slave. And it's easy to get people to sign up for power, <laughs> but to get people to sign up to serve, that's often a problem. Greatness isn't about lording over or ex exercising authority over others. Jesus redefines greatness here. He says greatness is found in serving others. Your spouse, your children, your family, your church, your community. You want to find greatness? That's where it's found. It's found in serving. And I want to say something to you because this is true. Here, joining us online, if your path to greatness isn't leading you to serve, you're on the wrong path. I want to say that again. If your path to greatness isn't leading you to serve, you're on the wrong path. I know this is kind of counterintuitive because we go, well, if I just had more, if I had more power, if I had more of this, if I had more of that, then I could do a lot more. Listen, if you aren't using what you have to serve others, why is God going to give you more? I guess I shouldn't have said that, right? But it's true. Because he's not going to give you more if you're not using what you have for his glory and honor. If you're not using what he gives you to serve, if you're not using the power to, to serve others, if you're not using the, the position that he's given you to serve others, then why would he bless you with more? Just ask him. Why would he do that? You don't need more, but we can all use what we have right now for the good of others. You know what's strange? is we know this. Sorry. We know this. And I can prove it to you that we know this. I, I mean, I probably could have just started here and had five minutes and been done. I'll prove it to you that this is, this is true. Who has impacted your life the most? Who has had the greatest, most positive impact on your life? Is it someone who ruled and lorded over you? Or is it a person who loved and served you? I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to bet. It is the person who loved and served you that made the greatest impact on your life. I'm betting, without a question. You know, politics and power, it becomes so pervasive in our society, it gets into our thoughts. And Jesus reminds us of what really matters, of what true greatness is. And here's the thing I want you to know today. Our greatest impact comes through serving others. Your greatest impact in life will come not when you achieve power and prestige and, and, and position. Your greatest, your greatest influence in life will happen 
when you serve others. And you don't have to be a president. You don't have to be a congressperson. You don't have to be a pastor. God wants to use you right now, right where you are, using the gifts, the talents, the abilities, what he has, what he has given you. He wants you to use that to serve others. It's not a race to the top. It's a race to the bottom. It's not a race to be first. It's a race to be last. It's not a race to greatness in the eyes of others. It is a race to greatness in the eyes of God. Now answer this truthfully, seriously. Wouldn't our world be better off if there was a rush to serve and not a rush to grab power? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't our world be better off? I had been, I knew that the election was coming up and I had been thinking through things and what was I going to say and, uh, you know, because people get really invested in politics and again, it's understandable because whoever leads, whoever's in charge, whoever governs can have a real impact on our lives. And I thought, God, what am I going to say? What am I going to share? And I, I typed these words October 30th, so it was before the election. I didn't know who was going to win. But I want to share from my heart to you. When I think about this, what Jesus said and what was in my heart is this. I don't want political power. I want kingdom power. I don't want political power to tell people how to live their lives and to to rule and dominate them and be over them. I don't want that. I want kingdom power to be able to love people, to proclaim Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, to let everyone know that he is the only way to God. I want to have power, kingdom power, to love others as Christ has loved me, whether they are friend or foe, whether we agree or we don't agree. I I want kingdom power to be able to devote my life to Christ in service to others. I want kingdom power to fulfill my purpose in this life, which is to honor Jesus and to make him known to others. I want kingdom power so that when I live my life, it will have an influence on others and it will impact them. It will change them. It will transform them because they come to believe in Jesus. That doesn't happen through political power. That only comes through kingdom power. And it comes as we take on the idea of what it means of power and greatness. It's not running to the top. It's becoming a servant to others. And we will experience kingdom power when we serve. Because when we serve, we make the kingdom of God evident to everyone. And Jesus' whole life demonstrates this. It demonstrates this truth, this reality, this way of living. (laughs) Mom and dad, have you ever, or have you ever seen it from your mom and dad where they kind of do this, do as I say, not as I do? Yeah, it's kind of frustrating, isn't it? Do as I say, not as I do. That's why some parents don't like to talk about when they were younger. Now they're going, do as I say. But when they were growing up, it wasn't what they did, you know? And that's okay. It's all right to confess and say, you know, I blew it growing up. I don't want you to do. That's what I've told my son. I've messed up some growing up, and I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I made. So, you know, do as I say. And what I am definitely trying to do, because I didn't do it before, but I'm doing it now. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't look at the disciples and say, do as I say. I'm over. I'm in charge of you. I'm ruling and reigning over you, so do as I say. It doesn't matter what I do. He didn't say that. He said this. He said, do as I do. I'm setting the example for you to follow. If you are my follower, you should follow my lead. And here's what he said. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is a purpose statement for Jesus. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He didn't live his life for himself. He lived his life and gave of himself for others. He tells us he is our ransom. Do you know what a ransom is? 
It was the price paid to set a slave free. Because according to the Scripture, old through the new, we are all slaves to sin apart from God. We are bound by sin. And Jesus came and gave his life to ransom us, to free us from the power of sin, the bondage of sin, the shame, the guilt, and the condemnation and judgment of sin. And because Jesus is our ransom, we are now children of God. That is God's love for you and me. That is Jesus' love for you and me, that He came and He gave His life, not to be served, but to serve. That's God's love for us, that while we were still sinners, we were estranged from God, we were in rebellion against Him, Jesus died for us. And here's the beautiful thing. When we serve like Jesus, when we serve like Jesus, we participate in His mission. See, you can serve without being a Christian. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. You can serve. But when we serve as followers of Jesus, there is a redemptive purpose in it. God is working in us and through us to reconcile the world to Himself. Serving takes on more than just, I'm, I'm watching babies in the nursery or I'm helping in the toddler room or I'm helping clean the church and the toilets. And I mean, that doesn't sound very redemptive, does it? But when you start realizing that when you serve, you are continuing the mission of Jesus, and God is working through you to accomplish His redemptive purpose in the world, suddenly serving takes on a whole new meaning. So serve. Follow the lead of your Savior. Follow the lead of the one who loved you and gave his life for you. And serve. Serve for his glory. Serve for his honor. Serve to see his mission fulfilled. Serve so that you make his kingdom a tangible reality on this earth. Why are you doing that? Because Jesus loved me and I love you and he loves you. That's why I serve. I had a pastor friend the other day I just saw on Facebook. He had He had a car that he gave away to a family in need. And the person was like, well, why, why did you give, why are you giving this thing away? You should trade it in. Or He says, I'll tell you why. And he told him about Jesus. Serve. Why, why are you being so kind? Why are you, why, what's going on with that? Why are you, I mean, why, why are you bringing me some cookies? Why are you calling them, checking I mean, what is going on here? I'm serving. Jesus loves you, and I love you. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. That's why I serve. We extend the love of Jesus to others when we serve. In a world that is caught up in what power and greatness is, when we serve, we demonstrate what Jesus said true power and greatness is. And serving is our best response because it is countercultural. And let me say this. Let others fight over the political scraps of position, prestige, power, and greatness. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm not saying don't vote. I'm not saying that who's in charge and who leads us isn't important. I'm not saying any of that, okay? Okay. I'm saying that there is a different kingdom that we are part of as believers in Jesus, and that takes priority and precedence in our life. And I'm not going to get in a political scrap when Jesus has called me to serve. I'll stand for right, what's right. I'll stand for what's true. I'll do my very best to vote according to what I believe God would have me to do. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But when it's all been put aside, this kingdom on this earth will come and go. That's what all kingdoms have done. But there is one kingdom that lasts forever. And I want to be part of that kingdom. And God wants people to be part of that kingdom. And the way we can introduce them into that kingdom is by serving. That is true greatness and our best response. So how are we going to respond? 
the election's been counted, the votes are in. How are you going to respond? You going to get bent out of shape, all upset if your candidate lost? You going to ride, celebrate, and rub it in the face of others if, if your candidate won? Or are you going to get on your hands and knees and serve like Jesus did? I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for Jesus. Our world is often chaotic and a mess. And the pursuit of power and greatness, that is something that seems to be innate in the hearts of men and women. And Jesus, you didn't say that greatness was a bad thing, but you gave us a path to greatness. And that path wasn't through power. It was through serving. So today we come and whether we're happy, we're sad, whether we're anxious, wherever we're at because of all that's going on, elections produce a lot of turmoil. Our heart's desire today is not for political power. It's for kingdom power. Power to love, power to serve, power to stand against injustice, power to do what is right. So would you work that in our hearts and lives today? And as we do that, would you work through us to make Jesus Christ known to our world? Because you love the world. You gave your son for this world so that through Jesus we could have eternal life. We humbly, we humbly ask this today in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. I feel like I would be wildly remiss not to let you know that we have opportunities for you to serve right here at church. <laughs> we are looking for people that are energetic and uh, friendly and personable, and I think that's pretty much all of you. Um, to help us in first impressions. Like, if you can stand there and say good morning, like, we got a job for you. Um, you we can help you out there. Serving is, like, the greatest thing that, um, that I have ever done, getting involved in serving at church. So um, we'd love to have you join us and serve with us and, it, and help us to impact others for Jesus. It's great. So um, just throwing that little plug out there. Brandy would love to see you at the info desk if you'd like to serve. There she's waving back there. All right, thank you so much for being with us today. We've loved having you here. Uh, thank you for joining online. And uh, again, if you're new with us, reach out at uh, trygrace.com connect. Thank you, and y'all have an awesome, awesome day. <laughs>